Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Feldman with the Consortium for Service Innovation. I'm going to do a quick orientation and housekeeping and then hand it right over to our wonderful speakers to get the show, the main event started. We will be talking about measuring community success. If this is what you came for today, you are in the right place. Uh, real quick about the Consortium for Service Innovation. We are a non-for-profit think tank uh, focused on customer engagement, and we get folks together a lot of times on public events like this. Very often it's our members working behind the scenes, collaborating, poking at new ideas, creating great new work that we get to share out publicly. That's why we're most known for things like KCS and intelligent swarming, and our members work on lots of other things behind the scenes as well. Uh, speaking of members, all of our work is made possible thanks to our generous and brave members who primarily fund the work and, and make the magic happen. So you'll see a few of our member logos scrolling here uh, across. And the work that um, our speakers are going to be presenting today is a collaboration of a bunch of members over several years. So it's something we're really proud of as an example of what our members can produce when they get their heads together with their experience. Quick plug for our upcoming Member Summit 2024. It will be in early April in Fort Worth, Texas. We're really looking forward to it. Um, fun fact, there's gonna be an eclipse on the day that we're all flying in just a few hours before the welcome reception happening in Fort Worth, Texas. We're, we're excited about that fun coincidence. So it's an extra fun reason to come. And it's also a good reason to book your travel early, we're reminding people. Speaking of events, over here on our events page, let me give us some more room here to see. We have tons of upcoming events posted, uh, several public, a few members only. So pop on over to our events page and please register for anything that piques your interest. And with that, I will stop sharing so we can get over to the main event. I'm excited for Christina and Matt and Arnfin to talk to us about this great work from our members. Great. Well, thank you. And can everyone see my screen? Yes. And we, we jump right to questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to our Measuring Community Success webinar. And this is a follow-on to the Measuring Self-Service Success that we presented last September. And so first, we'd like to introduce our speakers. Christina Rusin is the Community Program Manager at Akamai. And Christina has been in community management for over a decade, has a very strong background in business intelligence and data analysis for global customer care organizations. And she's been uh, recognized as a consortium innovator for all of her contributions to the consortium's work. And Matt Chin is the VP of ARP Consumer Care. And Matt has over two decades leading communities and social at Sage, Yahoo, Semantic, Oracle, and now AARP. And I'm uh, Arn van Alsterfjord and I head up the Digital Transformation Academy. And I've been leading self-service community and KCS programs and products um, for over two decades at Oracle and ServiceNow. And one of my focus areas has been, and passions has um, been how to measure the business value of these programs and optimize that value. And had the pleasure of working with this channel success team for over three years while at the consortium. And then next slide, let's get over here. So we formed a team to define the communities and social measurements phase. And it was nice to see we had both small companies and large companies. And these uh, companies included high tech, financial, gaming, and service organizations. And our verified and aligned vendors were also nicely represented. You can see here, we had a very large group of volunteers from these communities working on this project. And many of them are in attendance today and want to thank them for all their contributions to this project. And as we all know that the members really drive the innovation and really want to thank them here. So many of you should be familiar with the customer demand model. So customers typically have several channels to choose from to resolve their issues. And based on some industry data, if X is the number of cases, 
some companies are seeing 10x demand in self-service and 30x demand in communities and social. And when we speak to people, they get the general concept, but at the same time, always have questions on how did they come up with 10x and 30x for self-service and community uh, channels. So in phase one, we addressed the self-service metrics and again, shared that at our recent KCS in action. And in phase two, we're focusing on the communities and social channel. And we had some uh, great early presentations from HPE and ARP on their community and social landscape. And the team decided to narrow the focus off to the company owned community sites first for our 2A. And executives are certainly one of the key audiences for this measurement. And uh, Sage, one of the participating um, members, uh, shared how they not only present the metrics as a point in time, but also the power of showing the trends. And this is key to show that shift left of your digital transformation. Oops. So in um, phase one, Christina introduced us to the three Ds, the digestible, durable, and defensible. And we presented again those at the last uh, self-service webinar. And these resonated really well um, with the team and we continue to use them for phase two of this project. But once we got underway in the community phase, we realized that we needed to add another D, don't double count. And you're gonna see how critical this 4D is as we go through the measurements model with you. And this was a, a big aha moment for the team and many were actually revisiting their measurements as a result of uh, this new D. So we leveraged the template from phase one. So for those who uh, came to the self-service um, webinar, this should be very familiar, but we expanded it for phase two for the communities. And we use the same approach and format to ensure it was easy to understand, again, that digestible D, and also easy to present. And uh, this aligned format also helps us with that fourth D, that don't double count. And uh, Christina and Matt are gonna take you through the details of the spreadsheet shortly. But expanding on the customer demand model, the consortium members added the customer effort and problem type down below here. And as you shift left, not only does the customer effort decrease, the problem type becomes more and more known issues. And the team had another great aha moment in this community measurements phase. As we all know, the community handles both new and known issues. So we have to measure these separately to best understand this channel. So expanding on the customer demand model, the, um, oh, I apologize for this. Um, so what we did is we uh, broke this out to um, the two main activities that happen in a community, the view existing threads for known issues and post new threads for uh, new issues. And uh, Christina is gonna take us through the good, better and best measurements for the view existing threads. And um, then Matt's gonna take us through the good, better and best measurements for posting new threads. And so I'm pleased to pass it off to Christina for the view existing threads. Great, thank you, Arnfin, and hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to help represent some of the really great conversations we've been having in this group about measuring the community channel and maximizing it as well. Like Arnfin said, I'm going to focus on measuring just one of the ways that our communities deliver value, and that's through views of existing conversations. So if you go to the next slide. As we started to dig into this discussion, um, the team quickly discovered that site architecture is a very important factor in these measurements. When we talk about self-service engagements and successes based on consumption of online content, we're generally talking about visits to a website, right? That's where it all happens. If you have a website dedicated to community collaboration and distinct from where users search for and view knowledge, activity metrics can be pretty straightforward. If a visitor comes to your standalone community, that visit is pretty clearly a community engagement. Where things get more complex is if you have a single site like Akamai does that combines community and knowledge in one platform. So if a visitor comes to your integrated site, 
I can't simply sort that session into one bucket of engagement. They might look at knowledge and they might look at discussions in the same visit. This could also be true if you're stitching together data across silos into kind of a single consolidated view, even though that data starts out in multiple places. But either way, we need to think about how to allocate activity so that we don't overcount or double count engagements by ticking the box once for each channel the customer touches. So keep that in mind as we continue talking about this type of engagement. Standalone versus integrated makes a big difference. Next slide, please. Thank you. So back to talking specifically about discussion thread views. Like Arnfin introduced, these are the known issues of the community environment. And thinking back to some of our previous sessions about measuring self-service success with knowledge, we determined that a visit to our site that involved at least one view of knowledge could be considered an attempt at self-service or an engagement. Similarly with community, if a visitor comes to our site and reads an existing discussion thread, we can assume they were attempting to find information in the community. And so this is also a type of self-service engagement. And some percentage of those engagements will result in a user getting value, and then you have a success. So it seems very simple, right? Well, as we just noted, with an integrated environment, a visitor could look at knowledge, vote on knowledge, look at a discussion, comment on a discussion, and upvote it, and then start a new discussion, all in a single session. So we're going to need to use more data than just the visit to uncover the user's intent and how we delivered value to them. Next slide. So let's start with the simpler picture. In a standalone environment, we can follow the guidelines that we set out um, in our first phase of this program, the knowledge self-service engagement metrics, the, they match up just about exactly, right? Someone's coming, viewing content, and hopefully getting value out of it. So with our good, better, and best approach towards getting some sort of measurement around this type of engagement, at the good level, on a standalone environment, you could count engagement as the, simply as the number of website visits to your community. And you could think about maybe subtracting the number of new posts in that same time frame, just to make it a little more accurate. To get a better measurement, you could count only those visits where a visitor actually viewed a discussion during their visit, as opposed to simply you know, getting on the landing page and scanning lists of threads, how many of our visitors to the website opened and looked at a discussion. And if you really want to be accurate, this is where we get into some more advanced web analytics to really analyze that web session and pinpoint those sessions with exact behaviors. You could do things like um, spending more than a specified amount of time on a discussion versus just opening, glancing, and closing, or maybe scrolling to some percentage of the entire thread or maybe even identifying a view only engagement as one where they looked at discussions, but didn't take another action like starting a new conversation. So fairly straightforward when it comes to, stand, to standalone, but when we're talking about integrated, getting engagement data here is all about allocating your web activity, trying to sort these visits to your site into the appropriate buckets so that you're not double counting. The accuracy of that allocation is going to depend on what data you have available to you. So the simplest way might be to allocate visits based on your page view statistics. What percent of your page views are knowledge? What percent are discussions? And go ahead and allocate the visits that way. That's a very simple method. If you're able to identify visits with different types of content engagement, so how many people visited a page that's knowledge, how many people visited a community page, how many did both. You can go a little deeper into identifying visits with single activity and separating them out and then allocating just the leftover kind of blended activity visits. The most sophisticated method of getting this allocation really goes deeper, looking at detailed visitor behavior or even responses to session surveys to try to allocate between the two categories where that value delivery happened. However you choose to calculate this, it's going to be important to revisit any existing metrics you may have implemented for self-service success with knowledge only 
to see if you need to make adjustments to avoid any of those double counting issues that we talked about. I mean, I know we talk, one of my three Ds that I talk about all the time is, is metrics being durable, able to withstand change. This adjustment that I'm talking about, going back and revisiting metrics, isn't about adapting metrics to a process change or a business change. It's really about broadening our view of the customer's journey in our site and making sure that picture remains accurate as we widen the lens to incorporate knowledge and community. Next slide, please. So now that we've talked about identifying how many engagements we have, how many visits, how many tries at getting self-service, how do we determine what percent resulted in the delivery of value to the user, meaning a successful interaction? Again, we're gonna to need to rely on the data we have available. And we also need to understand this is not going to be exact. We will always be making some level of assumption or extrapolating from sample data because we don't as of yet have a way to read our users' minds. So some ways we can do this, um, we could just assume outright, basing our assumption on results from other companies that have used more sophisticated measurements. In a lot of cases, it's about, a, I think in knowledge, we say it's about a 20% success rate. That's what we're using. That was the method we used in the first phase of the program for knowledge success. So let's just assume a flat 20% is successful. We could improve that measurement by being a little more specific to our environment and our data, um, maybe using survey data, site survey data or session survey data. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about specifically using survey data in the next slide. Or again, at the best level, some of our more advanced web analytics tools can look at actual you know, clickstream path through the site, um, to identify sessions that did not result in a post at the end or didn't go to assisted support or sessions with positive actions or sentiment. You may wanna think about looking at, um, did the user like an existing post? Did they comment on it? Um, did they post their own comment to add to the thread? And if you're looking that deeply at the content of those posts, you may wanna think about adding sentiment analysis. So that comment that they made, was it a positive sentiment comment? Was it, oh, that really helped, thank you, versus I don't understand this at all. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm only gonna touch briefly on using survey data because we have other past presentations that dive into this in much more detail. And I won't repeat them here in the interest of time because you can find them in our reference material. But I do wanna to touch on a couple things to think about when you're surveying users in an integrated environment. Just like we did with engagement volume, we're gonna to need to allocate the feedback that indicates success to either knowledge or discussions. So here we can think about using the survey itself to help with allocation. Maybe consider including questions that help determine which type of content provided the success, or even making the survey more intelligent and more contextual based on the user's visit. So this could mean varying the survey questions based on their activity or just capturing where they entered, where they exited or where they spent the majority of their time. Next slide, please. Moving away from just quantifying number of engagements and how many of those might've been successful. Another valuable metric is how long it took to deliver value to our customers, what we call average length per success. So this is about calculating the amount of time someone spent on the site engaged with our content. This again, uses similar calculations as knowledge views. And I'm gonna refer you back to a prior session for some really exact tips on getting this information. But at a high level, a few ways, again, good, better, best, we could gather this data. So you could use data collected by other similar organizations to kind of get a rough estimate of how much time you think people are spending. Or another way we've found valuable is to find some people in our organization who may not be that familiar with the site, not intimately familiar with the site, but have a good knowledge of, the, of our products that our customers might be looking for an answer on and having them do some test runs to try and find an answer. Maybe um, finding ahead of, you know, ahead of time, choosing some topics that there's, we know there's known answers out there in the community. 
and having them just try and navigate through and find it and then average all of their test runs together to get kind of an average time to find an answer. You could again use uh, web analytics like average time on a page or um, Google Analytics 4 introduced the, the concept of engagement time, which is the time that the page itself was active in the user's browser. So you could kind of calculate total session time or time spent engaged with that um, conversation content. And best would be, again, going to some of these more advanced tools that can really track the path of a user through your site, identify the success paths for conversations, and then measure the length of that visit. Go ahead and move to the next slide. Yep. So average cost per success. Overall, we generally recommend using the same type of cost model in your self-service success calculations that you use for assisted support. So if you have a cost per case calculation that you're using, try and match your self-service cost per success to the same methodology. So if you include platform costs in cost per case, make sure you include them here, right? That's our recommended best practice. Also remember oh, that we're talking, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, also remember we're talking about users getting value from looking at discussions that have already been posted and potentially answered. It's likely that the main cost burden happened already in that initial conversation, not in a view of the existing threat. And whether there is cost associated with simple views of your content is likely going to depend on your architecture. If your platform is licensed per page view, there's a direct correlation you can draw. If it's based on the number of logins or user licenses allocated, then it's gonna depend on whether or not your site requires users to log in to see discussions. And of course, it's simpler if your community is standalone because then you probably have your own platform costs and personnel costs or program costs allocated to that site. In an integrated environment, costs are gonna be a little more blended unless you can clearly delineate them by like feature or license usage. If you can't clearly separate things out, it might be necessary to pool costs and then use that allocation again based on the success volume to avoid double counting costs. You certainly don't want to count the total cost of your platform in an integrated environment towards knowledge successes and then count the entire cost again for community. Matt's going to have a lot more to say about costs when he discusses new community posts and the responses to them. So I'm going to hand it over to him at this point. Thank you, Christina. So when we think about new threads coming into your community that are brand new, uh, Christina alluded to the new versus known model that we use when referring to knowledge base articles. We have known content versus new content. Same thing would apply here for the new threads coming in. You have new discussions coming in and those will take a life of its own as the conversation progresses. But there's some things that you would want to take into consideration as far as some flags or feature sets um, that, um, that your platform might have that you wanted to take into consideration. Um, and one of those would also equal the, the cost that you can, and calculating the cost per case or per post um, when it's answered, so you can receive uh, maybe a better ROI depending on not only um, the channels coming into which is your community, but also who is actually answering those, those posts. So I'm gonna to touch on a couple of the measurements here um, highlighted in yellow. So let's get started. So the first one, of course, you need to pull is the, the new posts coming in, so the new threads. We don't really have a good, better, best tier for this because you just need the, that volume. So you would pull that for that specific period for which you want to measure. Then you want to calculate the, uh, the, the percentage of the channel success. 
And here you would, as a good measure, basic measure, you could pull the percentage of new threads with a reply for that period. But you want to be able to, you might have to manually go through to see if all replies um, are actually tokens of value or not. A lot of people, like Christina said, would comment saying, hey, this is I'm having this problem too, or you might have spam, or you might have um, people who, uh, if a, a initial solution was was supplied um, said it didn't work for them or you could have multiple solutions so you want you want to make sure to to be able to, to segment uh, across all those different replies and move up to better uh, same thing you're going to be pulling that volume to get the percentage of new threads with the replies but here um, you could take advantage if your platform supports um, specific flags such as marking things as correct or likes, or if people are agreeing with the answers or marking things as best answer, you can actually analyze those for uh, tokens of value. So answers or, um, or likes, what, what have you, um, that you would wanna include that your system supports. And then best would be to pull all, all that thread set of threads again using those parameters but if your if your platform is taking advantage of a more mature feedback infrastructure, so say uh, the the original poster can then respond and say, "Hey, this this is the this is the answer that I used based on my original question." You're kind of closing the loop with the original poster. You'd want to uh, take advantage of that as best. All right, then we're looking at the average length of the successful engagement in minutes. And here, as a basic good measure, you can pull the average minutes to reply on threads for a period. This will be a, a manual pull. Uh, if you move up to better, you could be leveraging, again, the, these, these different uh, flags that are offered on your platform, as well as if you can grab the timestamps of when those replies and posts were coming in. Um, but this would still be a manual pull. And best would be if you could pull all of those, but get some autom if you have some automation or scripting that can do the calculations based on the timestamps and then do, to do that average uh, calculation. Next slide. And then, oh, and then, and then uh, to calculate cost per successful, Engagement, um, this is your, one of your mo most important ones because here's where you could break out uh, the, the cost data based on um, your costing or charging methodology that your, that your company uses to calculate um, the, the total answers for a period. And I think, uh, did we, is this, do we have another slide after this? No, um, we, we don't, but yeah, if you want okay. to like, uh, take through the uh, community versus uh, company response. Yeah, so the, the, uh, so for here the, you would you could you could break this out by um, by role. So if an agent was answering um, the post, it would be a different calculation as opposed to say the community the community, someone in the community, which would, would most uh, most likely be cheaper. So you want to want to do this uh, basically, by how much it costs per case for each of your roles to be answering all of these in, in the community. Um, and you could even have, if you have partners in there or developers, they may have a different um, rate depending on your cost methodology based on salary or how much time they spend on the community to answer that would work into that equation too. So you could actually break out not only if we're say if how much it would cost for just some the general community answering questions as a channel, but then you can go deeper and break it out. Here's how much it costs per case for an agent or for a, um, or for a partner or for a, a customer to answer those. Right. Yeah. And, and many members were uh, mentioning that they were using that data to show it's so much uh, cheaper if uh, the community answers it than uh, the um, company and uh, help justify their rewards and recognition program for their community and such. So a lot of lot of great uh, discussion as you break those out. But um, I wanna focus on uh, the, the next. So 
the team didn't want to just stop on how to measure the community channel. Um, we also had many meetings discussing best practices for integrating communities into the customer journey and leveraging KCS and other transformation programs to drive improvements in the community space, as well as the overall service ecosystem. So Christine and Matt, we have so many examples on the website, but Christine and Matt will share a few examples. So Christina, over to, to you for the first example. Sure, I'm gonna talk about um, community and our, our KDE is our knowledge domain experts. One of the great things about a community site is that the customer is 100% in the driver's seat and we are the observers. They decide what to search on. They decide what to view, what types of questions to ask, what kind of comments to make. So we can get a great deal of information about what is important to them in their own context, which is what drives great knowledge, right? So all of that data is really useful for tuning the self-service ecosystem. At Akamai, we provide community data to our KDEs so that they can develop informed initiatives around improving our external facing knowledge content. I've listed just a few examples here. I'm using search data to identify new or underserved terms that our customers are looking for, or using page view activity to identify high traffic discussions and uh, harvesting them for knowledge. Also analyzing to see if there are any best practices that could help other content attract views. The list keeps growing. It's a great opportunity for KDEs to exercise their analytical and creative sides. So I would encourage you highly to get them involved with you as a team member in looking at community activity and understanding it and harvesting it to improve your knowledge base. Over to Matt for his examples. Sure. So beyond Q and A's, community is a gr of course a great channel for those transparent conversations and collaboration, but, but there are a number of different things you could do to really elevate it and to drive more people to it, to make it corporate more comprehensive. Um, Christina talked about how Akamai, the knowledge base is integrated, um, which is you know, another, another feature that you definitely would want to add to go alongside the conversations taking place. But how do you make it so, so like this is the first place they would go in the morning. You want to make this their morning newspaper, your customer's morning newspaper. And it could be uh, your complete support portal if you add enough activity and, um, and drivers to this. So if you do things like uh, add announcements, um, anytime you come out with new product releases uh, or events, you could place those as uh, announcements in your community uh, to grow that expectation um, of I can find the latest information um, in the community. And I, I'm, this is the first place I'm going to check. Um, you can implement an ideas area. Some communities offer this as a module you could turn on where people can submit their ideas for products and then people can up and down vote them. Um, this is also great because you can also bring in your development team as part of the community to discuss new features or um, and also to, to, to basically follow up when a new idea that the community has submitted uh, shows up in a product and makes them really feel like they've, they're part of that development process for as the, as the product is moving down its timeline. Uh, definitely be showcasing new articles or um, when, they, when they're published, um, the communities I've worked in, we did this every two weeks. You would publish the, the new articles or updated articles just to make sure everyone's um, seeing those. Highlight interesting conversations taking place. You pin those to the top of, of um, your discussion list. A lot of you can easily pin conversations with the feature sets in community. Uh, offer sneak previews. So you could offer sneak previews of what's coming with a product, um, host live events to talk about uh, how people are using products. Um, and then if you have a blogging system in your community, uh, are your agents good writers? Do you have any partners that are good writers? So invite them to deep dive into like a little known uh, product feature to really uh, write about it and write how, how they're using that. Uh, it will also boost their identity in the community 
and making them a, a celebrity um, if you if you reuse them over and over. Um, so really, really good ways to to uh, elevate how your how your community uh, can be run and how people perceive it. Great, thanks, Matt. And we do have a number, we're gonna to get to the Q and A portion shortly, but we do have a number of resources, spreadsheets, documentation, recordings, member meetings. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah to take us through those resources. Yes, I'm gonna, if you could stop sharing, I'll give a quick tour. Great, so I'm gonna, Go back to sharing where we were. So of course, Christina dropped the link in the chat and we'll email it out to everyone. So you all have access to it, but if you ever find yourself on our website, which I assume is your homepage, because why wouldn't it be? You are actually just two clicks away from getting right to this resource. So here's our main website. And uh, on our main website, this is where you can find access to all of our events and register for those and our blog articles and our training. But the work, when we talk about the work and the methodology, that all lives in what we call our digital library. So you're one click away from it here. And here it all is. Some of these things hopefully you're already familiar with. But if you scroll down just a bit, here on the homepage, we have this resource featured. So you can click right into Understanding Success by Channel. You don't need to be logged in to see this whole thing. There are throughout the resource, a few, a few links that point to some member only supplemental material and references where you would need to log in. But everything that we've talked about here today for the most part is publicly available. So here's uh, the overview and then all of the work that this group did to make others successful with using this spreadsheet, all the, the context and executive communication and uh, how to approach it and you can pop into the details right here for actually using the spreadsheet. Uh, we've created, the group has created a Google sheet for you that you can copy or download if you wanna use a different program. And the sheet itself has all the instructions to help you use it and be successful with it. So lots of, lots of details throughout here. It's goodies for you there. All right. That's that. Well, let's uh, open it up to uh, questions. So I think we didn't really have any questions in uh, chat that we have not answered yet, but any new questions from anybody? Hi, this is Eileen. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. Great. Uh, thanks. Great um, presentation. and knowledge. I've gained a lot from this <laughs> session. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about your shift left methodology. I use it to um, explain and convince internally that, um, you know, people are changing their ways of seeking and finding knowledge. And one of the things that um, I explain is that it's generational. So like new younger generations may have a different um, path to knowledge. And so I'm wondering if your, um, you know, your, uh, your display has been updated to use things like AI or the generation that might Google first before using manuals, things like that. Yeah, and it, it definitely has. There's been many discussions on AI, and certainly, as you point out, um, for self-service, uh, I think 90 plus percent when our members are, are sharing um, are using Google uh, before mm -hmm. going into the site. So yeah, all of those nuances are, are definitely in there. And as you point out, um, everyone has different preferences depending on their, their experiences and uh, uh, to your point on the ages and such, but the the model um, works well for for those. As you look at, you know, again that shift left, definitely the um, it's so much easier to just do a a quick search and get the information mm -hmm. um, versus if you need to post a community thread and and get it from the community or the company or um, most effort actually contacting an agent, um, creating yes. that, that case request and such. So. 
it um, AI and and definitely different generations align well to that model. But any yeah. Else? Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say one of the things that I've I've found, especially at um, companies who've been around pre open kind of Internet is there's a real resistance a lot of times to expose your own company's content to the Internet, yep. which actually hampers um, people discovering the, the right information and encourages them to go talk about it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So part of that shift left is understanding that people aren't necessarily going to come to your site and then look for an answer. They're going to pop open their browser, search in Google, and then go consume whatever it is that got served to them. So if you're hiding that information from public search, you're doing a disservice to your, you know, the information that you publish and potentially getting wrong information in the hands of your users. So one of the things that we had to really convince people of is, you know, knowledge and even discussions, there's trepidation. Well, I don't really want them to see that there's a problem with the software. Like if they have the software, guaranteed they're talking about that problem somewhere. Wouldn't you rather it be on your site? Wouldn't you rather it be them reading your release notes about how to fix things? Um, my favorite example of this was uh, a, a company I worked for prior is we had a lot of trepidation around people even having a community because they didn't want users to talk to each other. What if they start slamming us? What if they start complaining about us? What do we do? And my favorite example was that somebody came in pretty hot into our community and posted this big screed about how something was broken. And another user answered them and said, you're on, the, you're on an old version of this. This got fixed ages ago. Why don't you talk to your salesperson and upgrade? And the community team just sat back and went, yes, yes, that is exactly the answer. We don't want to have to supply that our users are supplying to each other. So it is a, a shift sometimes, not just in users, but in the business thinking within your organization. And there are controlled ways to release this information. It's not as scary as they might think it is. Yeah. Community will check each other for sure. Mm -hmm. And 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 Eileen, you also must mentioned, you know, generations accessing knowledge. One thing that's helped us at AARP is re you know, reaching younger generations who are caregivers and whatnot. Um, we've had a lot of success with chatbots that search our knowledge base and provide answers. Um, we have a chatbot on our help site, but then we've also front-ended our, our online chat, uh, our Facebook Messenger channel, and our SMS channel. So when people enter those, they can converse with the chatbot, and the chatbot will try to help them by searching the knowledge base for them. So you're kind of bringing the knowledge base to them in the channel of their choice. Um, and if it doesn't work out, then they're transferred to an agent. The agent can see what what the bot tried to do, so they're not answer, you know, an, an, answering the uh, or posing the question twice, right? Once to the bot and then to the agent. And that help out? Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Thank you all. Yep. And just to expand on also that shift left for the purposes of this presentation, we kept it fairly simple, but definitely as part of that shift left, uh, embedded product support, auto support, proactive support. Um, so many additional um, vehicles to, uh, to help the customer. And as you shift further and further left, AI definitely helps out uh, tremendously there in addition to the, the other channels. Great. Um, so will you be <laughs> updating the shift left model to, to incorporate some of the new um, methods of gaining knowledge? Yeah. And or in fact, just not in, in sync with the latest model? Yeah, in fact, in the uh, the uh, courses, uh, digital transformation fundamentals, um, and as well as managing a digital economy, those have been updated for that. Uh, and certainly on the website, um, there's much information about uh, those other other channels also. Okay, thank you very much. And Kendall had a comment. You want to share that with the Sure. I just I just was commenting on um, if any of your teams are struggling with the justification for a community for worry, nervousness, fear, uh, what have you of, of 
users talking to each other, um, one of the things that we find is um, while we do have a community that we host at F5, there's an extension of that community that lives in places like Reddit, Stack Overflow, even Twitter at times. Um, so I just put out there as food for thought, thought if any of you are struggling within your own teams to justify or even stand up a community platform for those same fears or, or worries. Um, and then I could even go even farther by saying, do your, do your organizations host community-driven events or um, product release events and things of that nature? Well, if you do, more often than not, you're inviting your users, your customers, et cetera, and they're probably talking to each other at those types of events. So um, just sort of a different lens at looking at why a community adds value to a, uh, to a self-solve strategy. Yeah, and that'll, that'll happen naturally, right? If you don't offer your own community, it's branded. They'll set one up on many of, many of the community channels out there. So jump on Discord. <laughs> Great. Other questions, comments? I actually do have a knowledge. Marcella here. Good okay. afternoon from Ireland. Um, I have a question regarding harvesting knowledge from communities. Um, usually we had a lot of knowledge um, on the community side, very granular answers, you know, that sometimes we're not in a knowledge based article. Um, and they're very specific cases. And we really wanted to make sure that we capture that in a knowledge base article to make sure that, you know, it kind of falls under the uh, reuse and improve. And, you know, if it's updated and it, it gets um, updated and it's not just an outdated, you know, thread on the forum. However, you know, we struggled because we didn't have an automation for this. So it was mainly a manual effort. And the communities on the VMware site, it's it's just, you know, so many threats every day and so many posts that it was such a struggle for us to kind of harvest and spot if something was really a knowledge gap. Um, how have you been approaching this? You know, was it an automated process? Have you been managed to kind of solve that problem? Yeah, in fact, that, that has been a big uh, conversation. I think we had a few meetings on that. Um, is that, as you point out, harvesting from a community thread, if you can get it into a structured knowledge article, then it's easier to consume, it takes less time by that uh, customer. And then again, easier to link with that problem description. We also find with the community threads, oftentimes they don't know, does it pertain to my exact version of it? There might be multiple answers and maybe they didn't uh, um, go through and click the, the correct answer. So um, what we found, and we actually have one of our, um, uh, verified vendors um, has a really nice automated solution for this, but um, leveraging what um, Christina was talking about with the KDEs, oftentimes they're looking at, they'll run a report for here's the top um, viewed community thread. So they're not looking at all community threads, but just the, the top ones. And then they will harvest the, um, the question and then the correct answer um, from that community thread and one of the uh, the tools that, um, uh, one of the verified tools, what they'll do is actually provide attribution to that responder. So it'll be in your knowledge base, but it'll give the attribution to that responder. And then they can click on the that responder to see all of their activity in the community. So it's a nice way to recognize your community members. And people always talk about how do you get your external customers to contribute to the knowledge base? We found that the, um, harvesting the knowledge from the uh, um, the community threads and giving attribution is a great way to do that. And then it, it not only is easier to consume, but then it provides more, uh, the customers have more trust in it because it's been reviewed and approved by the company as a whole. And then what we see from a uh, kind of a best practice is again, you're referencing the community in that knowledge article um, but then they'll also pin that knowledge article on the top of the uh, community thread. So it's very uh, integrated there. And some, you know, again, some tools, they do it very nicely automated. Um, other members have just used some workarounds to do the, the same concept. But additional uh, questions on that? Well, I was just going to say, to your point of sifting through huge volumes of threads, I suspect this is going to be one of the places where some of these large language model tools are going to really serve us well to be able to ingest huge amounts of things and spit out kind of summaries or pinpoint places where 
um, you know, there is an existing knowledge article for this thread and the person didn't find it and can we figure out why? That's something that our KDEs do now. Like, well, this is actually a known issue. What can I do about this knowledge article to make it more obvious that this was the solution to the question the customer was asking? But for volume, I, I think some of these tools are gonna be really useful for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Spot on answer. Thank you. Great. That was a great question. Other questions or comments? I had a question that might have been covered in the first half. I unfortunately missed it. But did we discuss at all the potential challenges in getting leadership support to staff some of our shift left initiatives? Communities being a prime one, for example. I've struggled with this uh, in the past in previous organizations. And my argument, my counter argument to the, we don't have time to do this being, you don't have time to help customers because you're too busy helping customers. Fell on deaf ears uh, all too often. I'm just wondering, was that something that we covered in kind of overcoming internal resistance to giving the appropriate investment uh, into these shift left attempts? Yeah, in fact, um, there's been a lot of companies, uh, NetApp is a great one that's uh, shared this recently, but many other companies, they show that as the as you shift left, not only are your customers happier, but your average cost per um, issue resolved goes down dramatically. And then when you do the weighted average, then you can see that as you're shifting left, your weighted average of your issues are going down um, quite substantially. So it depends on uh, your organization, what they value. We see a lot of service organizations really look at cost per case. That was one of their, their critical ones, as well as certainly customer satisfaction. And if you can change that currency to cost per issue, and we definitely have that in the spreadsheet, you'll see as one of the, uh, that rows, the, the cost per issue is in, you can see as you shift, make that shift, you're dramatically reducing that uh, cost per issue. So. That's, we see one of the big ways of trying to get that, um, that support for that investment. And then as Matt was talking about also, even when you're down at the community level, you get some communities that um, the customers, uh, the companies are answering most of them. And you really wanna tap into that external community. And as you can show that, well, if the external community answers it, here's our cost. And if we have to answer it, our cost is much higher. And that really helps to justify the investment in the, in the community programs, such as the, um, um, such, you know, your incentive programs to uh, give them the trinkets, bring them to your, uh, your uh, annual meetings and such, and give them much more exposure to those external community members. But others, um, Matt? Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, really stress the, the differentiation between one-to-one -one interactions that they're working in a call center to now your community is one to many. So when someone solves an issue, it's not just solving it for one person that's archived for, for you know, hundreds of people to, to look at and solve their issue without even contacting you. So um, if you can really show that and get them to visualize that, that that's a big, uh, big dimension to really evangelize. I, I'm flashing back to the slide where I had that pitched too, and it was the siloed conversation. And I even think I used a, a screenshot from Get Smart with the cone of silence for anybody who remembers that. That's your typical <laughs> support, siloed conversations that help nobody except for, I mean, KCS goodness aside, but yeah, yeah. the forums provide and other community levers so much more potential. Absolutely. I think if you can also get your users to be authenticated in some way, whether that's like they, you know, are joining the discussion so you know who they are. Um, so much great info today about how we can support the use case of like reducing support costs, but you can also very easily tie it back to pipeline generation then and opportunities where you're influencing expansion and things like that. I actually think that's been the greatest driver um, at my business in, in making the case for community is community led growth and development and um, the efficiency gains are sort of a, a nice bonus on top of that. Yeah, that's a great point. In fact, there was a lot of discussion uh, when the members were sharing their community about these other benefits. Um, 
they see that um, those who are engaged in the community are much more loyal to the company because they have their their tribe, if you will, all their relationships. So they don't want to move to another product. Um, we had some companies that were measuring the uh, the sales cycle that uh, they get them engaged in the community early on when they're doing the evaluation of the product and the sales cycle was uh, dramatically reduced. So a lot of great benefits to your point, um, getting them engaged in the community. Yeah, and that is a great point. And, and I think the key is trying to understand which of those benefits is going to perk up the ears of your leadership. Some of them are going to be really focused on operational efficiency gains, and that's going to be what motivates them. Some of them don't want to hear about that. They want to hear about lead generation. They want to hear about renewal rate, you know, re reduction in customer churn. Right. I think we have room for one more question. All right, well, I wanna thank everyone. Uh, Sarah, I'll pass it back to you for the next upcoming stuff. Yeah, thanks Arnfin. Thank you to you Arnfin and Christina and Matt. That was a great walkthrough full of information. Well, I'll make sure to actually link this recording with the main resource because I think it'll uh, be a great, great compliment to help folks make the most of this. Um, we've uh, shared the links. We'll share this recording out with everyone and we hope to see you at another event soon. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.